you to our witnesses. Um, Mr. Gay, given the uncertainties and the stresses of the current budgetary environment, how is NASA planning to leverage the recommendations in the current uh, survey? And in particular, I was looking at the recommendation around an expanded role for NASA in the post-discover environment. So if you could respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, yes. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the budget stress, of, you know, fortunately the Cato Committee recognized the, the environment that we were operating in and, and the, the, the possibility or likelihood of, of budget stress. And for that, and, and because of that, they did give us some, some I think, very good guidance in terms of uh, decision roles of what to do if we are faced with these with, with problems as we work towards implementing the, the recommendations of the Decadal Survey, and, and we do appreciate that very much. Um, they also recognized, you know, when they when they recommended augmentations for explorers and also for the Drive Initiative, they recognized that the um, the heliophysics program has a lot in the pipeline right now, and those changes uh, or those enhancements or augmentations would not be realized in, until sometime down downstream when we can rebalance the when we can rebalance the portfolio gradually. Um, in in terms of the expanded role for space weather, the as the the uh, survey committee pointed out, uh, the, the recommendations for an augmented space weather capability were beyond our current scope and funding and also were considered a lower priority than the science program recommendations that they made. And just out of curiosity, though, if there um, is the next budget submission intended to incorporate the, um, the decadal survey recommendations, even if that's over some period of time? Uh, yeah, I, I believe you know. Beginning in the in the 15 budget request, we we would begin to see a, a, a you know some some maybe slight rebalancing. But uh, I mean, that our goal would be to to uh, achieve that over the next five five to ten years. Dr. Baker. Yeah, I would just like to uh, point out that one of the things we did in the decadal survey was to recommend the IMAP mission. This is the interstellar mapping and um, acceleration probe. And this has dual use. It's both a, a wonderful basic science mission to observe the outer part of the heliosphere, but it also would make key uh, solar wind measurements, uh, solar wind measurements that would be a space weather monitoring kind of a tool. So I think there's a great deal we can do to have both basic science and operational capability. And this is uh, just one example of, of the dual use kind of capabilities we talked about. Thank you. Ms. Frigioni, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name, Frigioni. Um, if you, I wonder if you could tell me about the accuracy of predicting space weather events, because it does seem to me that those are increasingly important um, in terms of our operation of our critical infrastructure, and in fact, every day, because we have more infrastructure that's um, impacted potentially by space weather. And so how good are the, um, is the current uh, prediction capability and what kinds of improvements can we expect to gain with the implementation of the research recommended in the survey? Thank you, Ms. Edwards. That is one of the uh, components of our operational forecasting scheme is to always validate and verify our forecasts. So we have made significant advancements in um, the error of when the actual event impacts the Earth. Where we were at 13 hours, our error could be anywhere within a 13-hour window. Now we've reduced that down to a six-hour window on when we know that the uh, coronal mass ejection will impact um, the Earth. So that is great, uh, great strides in improving our forecast. And also the, the inlel model that I talked about, the first uh, model that we've been able to operationalize from NSF and NASA definitely played, played a critical role in that. So continuing to transition those research into operations is important to advance the forecast accuracy. But it's still not terribly accurate. So for example, even with a six-hour window, it is, I mean, it would be really difficult to implement any activity on the ground or, or protecting the infrastructure 
in that kind of time frame. So that's a six hour window on when it would impact the earth, but the actual alert or warning goes out one to three days in advance. So you actually do have time in advance to take those precautionary measures on the power grid, on your GPS, and on the, the satellite instruments to put them into safe mode. Thanks. And then um, I have 13 seconds, let me take advantage of that. Um, <laughs> in your opinion, um, and, and this is to any of our panelists, um, how well do you think the public really understands the linkage between uh, the research and the applications and their everyday experiences of just being able to power on a cell phone? I would say that there has been tremendous improvement in public awareness of uh, the effects of space weather in, let us say, the last uh, five to ten years but we still have a long way to go. We still have a lot of work to do to make people understand what is the variability of the sun, how does it affect the Earth environment, and how does it bore down to their daily lives, as your question indicates. I think we have uh, a, an opportunity with the approaching solar maximum to really uh, see more frequent kind of uh, disturbances, to put those in proper context, and to really help the public understand what to be worried about and what not to be worried about. And I think it is key that all the agencies play that role. One thing also, um, as, as we were looking at the solar maximum and using that as a potential to increase the education and outreach, one of the emphasis is that the solar maximum is an increase in the number of events, but not necessarily an increase in the significance of the events. So an event can happen at any time, and we wanted folks to make sure that they weren't just focusing on the solar maximum and that they were safe before or after the solar maximum, because an event can happen at any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow along because I'd asked earlier, uh, Mr. Gay, um, your um, opinion about expanding NASA's role, but I didn't have a chance to hear from Ms. Fergioni about how that expanded role for NASA would relate to um, to NOAA's activities. And so, if you could just give me a minute. Thank you, Ms. Edwards, for that question. Um, one of the things with our operational mission is that we are able to rely upon our, our successes in our hurricane forecasting, our tornado forecasting, as I mentioned, those particular areas that we have proven success in the past. And that includes, um, with the hurricane model in particular, the interagency modeling and the transition to research that um, we have been able to put into place and improve our hurricane track and, um, and intensity forecast. So a proven success, as you saw, with Hurricane Sandy. And so those roles and responsibilities, um, we believe, should stay, the operational responsibilities should stay with NOAA in regards to uh, producing those operational forecasts and warnings. So given that, what would you see as, um, to the extent that NASA were taking on um, additional areas of responsibility, how would you see that? Well, um, additional responsibilities, they are already doing uh, the basic and, uh, and applied research. So if they can continue to work with us on the transition of that applied research um, through our community modeling, that would be the ideal situation. And so can you just explain to me, and Mr. Gay, perhaps you could chime in here, what are some of the key challenges uh, for transitioning the basic solar and space physics research into tools that can be accessed by users and applied in the operations that Ms. Fergione spoke about? I, I, uh, I think some of the key challenges are validation of the models and, and uh, user acceptance of, of those models through, you know, through a, they, they do have to go through an extensive validation period, and that's typically a, a, a very uh, uh, hard point, and uh, takes a lot of time and effort, and, uh, you know, and I would defer to uh, my colleague from, from NOAA to, to talk about what it's like on the receiving end of those, but I'm sure it's very difficult for them to, to uh, they, they build confidence in the models that they're operating using at this time, and it, there's a high bar, a very high bar for them to, to accept a, a, a new model in that place. Ms. Fergiani? Yeah, a point I will make is in regards to our requirements process. So as we look at our customers' requirements and their changing needs and increasing demands for this type of information, that's where we can then hone, hone in on what particular model would ideally help improve our forecasts 
to meet those customer needs. So it's really about the requirements and also the validation, as Mr. Gay talked about. And Dr. Baker, and, and as you respond, I wonder if you could also um, tell me the degree to which you think that there are current Federal agency activities that can be uh, coordinated or better coordinated, including funding and plans for space weather, and how effective the current coordination is. <clears throat> yeah, let me respond to or um, address a point that was just made here. Um, um, I would say that a difference between terrestrial weather and space weather is the degree of understanding we have of the basic processes. I would say that we are uh, far behind um, where terrestrial weather is as far as our understanding of the fundamental uh, basic processes. We are being surprised all the time by what the sun does and how the Earth and the, and the Earth's environment responds. So um, I think there is a much closer coupling in, in many respects between NASA basic research and, and the needs thereof and, uh, and what can be uh, transitioned into an operational state. Um, I would say that, uh, therefore, uh, to go to the second part of your question, it is probably more crucial to have close cooperation between agencies in this developing field than it is where uh, the physics is sort of cut and dried. And so, um, again, I am encouraged by the fact that um, space weather, the necessity to understand this complex system, is, is making the agencies work more closely and cooperatively. I just think that um, there is more that can be done, and I think that uh, my hope is that the decadal survey will be a catalyst to make this work even better and that there will be more coordination of, um, let's say, the basic research, the aspirations of that research, the funding uh, that is necessary to transition. Uh, but I think it is really going to require that uh, all players work in an orchestrated way to try to make this the most efficient and effective, well, especially when we look at how limited the resources are going to be over the next years. This has to be done very efficiently and effectively. Thank you. And, you know, Mr. Chairman, one thing that we didn't have a chance to get actually on the record was not just the impacts to us as um, civilians in, um, in this environment, but what the impacts are on our critical na national infrastructure that is related to national security and the importance of uh, strengthening what we are doing right now so that we don't have any gaps um, in understanding space weather and its, and its impact, and uh, so that over the long term that we are um, considering all of our infrastructure um, uh, in this environment. So thank you.